In this episode of our best of season, we are exploring all things dairy. I'm Kat Neville and this is Feast TV. We've had a chance to visit a number of dairies over the years, from cows to goats to sheep. And in this episode, I've pulled together three of my favorite segments featuring milk and cheese. So throughout the episode, I am going to be making a yogurt cake that has orange zest and dark chocolate. And I'm using the yogurt in this particular cake rather than cream or another type of dairy because yogurt really gives a wonderful tang to anything that it's incorporated in. So I'm gonna get started when we get back from this first segment. We are going to be heading to Kansas City to meet the family behind Chateau Milk Company. We visited them a few years ago and the dairy has only grown since. My name is Barbara Chateau and we're at Chateau Milk Company here in Osborne, Missouri. This is my family's farm. Actually the dairy has been here for over 70 years. The actual farm has been in my family for over a hundred years. We're gonna go in here to the left and you can actually see where we keep all of our flavors of milk. Oh our wow! Milk. Many years ago, and also when I was growing up, my, my family uh, sold milk to a big conglomerate, if you will. Well, about 11 years ago, or probably more like 12 years ago, the milk prices were extremely low, um, and feed and other costs were extremely high, so we really had no choice. We had to do something different in order to survive the family farm. And that's when Chateau Milk Company, the concept, started. And in the morning, all the trucks will come in, and this will be totally empty, and we'll have to start all over again. This is like old-fashioned. It is. This That's is so awesome. Um, actually, this is our bottle washer. Um, this is an old relic, if you will, because there's not new ones anymore. The, the bottles are washed and sanitized in this machine. Then it goes through the wall there to the conveyor, and that's where then the milk is actually filled. We were scared to death to start out, and we only had 80 cows, and we were very concerned about the fact, would people buy our milk in glass bottles and fresh from the farm? Um, actually, two months after we started, we had to double our herd. The, the response was phenomenal, and today we have over 400 cows. 2,000 gallons a day? Yes, yes. So 4,000 bottles a yes, day. Yes. And, and you know, we always need more milk. We're always telling the cows, milk some more and give them more music so they'll be happy. Wait a second, more music? Yes, we, cows like music and it makes them relax more and, and they're happier cows. What kind? Oh, you, you know, I like classical. Yeah. Some of the guys up at the barn like country, so we argue about that. <laughs> We milk the cows, we bottle our own milk, and we sell directly to the consumer as well as to the local grocery stores about 100 miles from the farm. Uh, we have control of what they're eating, what, what any type of medication that they're given, and they aren't given growth hormones. I think that's a very important thing. We utilize all of our product. We now make butter, cheese, ice cream, and ice cream sandwiches. So it's, it's, it's top quality milk, and it's really the freshest in town because oftentimes our trucks could deliver milk that was actually milked that morning uh, when they wait for it to be bottled and processed that day. These are like pampered cows. They are. We want them to be. And then we name them and we love them. That's They're awesome. our most valuable employee. I can't wait to meet these cows. Well, we want you to. We're going to go to the barn. Oh, next. perfect. We started out with the two staples of flavored milk. We had chocolate and strawberry. Our chocolate was just the best chocolate we think in the whole world, and it was very, very popular. Um, after probably a year and a half to two years, we started doing other flavors. We actually took root beer to a festival in Plattsburgh, Missouri, and then got lots of calls about the root beer milk. And now root beer milk is second to chocolate as far as sales go. Uh. <laughs> I love it. Wait, I'm doing it again. Uh. <laughs> That's fantastic. 
You know, Chateau Milk Company, the future and where we want to go is, is something that people often ask me. Uh, and I think the thing that they want to hear is that we're going to be really big, we're going to you know, ship everything. But that's not really where we want to go. We want to be a local family farm. We want our neighbors and customers to know Chateau Milk, the people who actually handle the cows and provide them with fresh milk, butter, and ice cream. I think we'll expand our cheese products and maybe some of our butter and so those kinds of things we could ship. But our milk and um, our flavored milks is something that you can get locally, only at Chateau Milk. So our visit to Chateau Milk Company was one of my favorites because there were baby cows and kittens, but really the main message of what they're doing at Chateau Milk Company is something that is reverberating throughout the dairy industry. A lot of small family-run farms are starting to launch their own brands, including Marcoute Jersey Creamery in Illinois and Rolling Lawns. And if you want to see all of those stories, just head to feastmagazine.com. We've got tons of other content that lives there as well. So so I'm gonna get started, and the first thing I'm going to do is prepare my pan. When you see that in a recipe, it just means to butter your pan and put a little bit of flour in so that nothing sticks. This is parchment paper, which I'm going to be putting at the bottom, and I'm just going to go ahead and get a little bit of this butter and run it along the inside. Grab a tiny bit of flour. And just tap it all along the inside of the pan. Super easy. Okay. A little bit of parchment paper just goes right in the bottom. Don't use wax paper because the wax will melt and you don't want to eat that. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna go ahead and zest a couple of oranges because that's gonna give wonderful, almost bitter orange flavor to this cake. The trick with zesting is that you want to make sure that you don't get all the way down to the white pith because that's really bitter. What you're looking for are all of the aromatic essential oils that live in the skin. I need about two tablespoons for this recipe. All right, I'm gonna finish up this second orange and while I do that, head with me over to Cool Cow Creamery. They're making some amazing Gouda-style cheeses and they have a pig named Wilbur. We drove down a gorgeous, windy, two and a half mile gravel road to come here, the Brinkman Farmstead, where Cool Cow Cheese is made. I don't have to wear a hairnet this time, which is lovely. I'm wearing a baseball hat, and we are going to be able to see how this wine country cheese is made from start to finish. Let's go inside and check it out. I don't know if you know much about this place, but we bought it about four and a half years ago, and we didn't know, we were buying an antique barn that has perfect provenance. And then we have a little store, and then upstairs we have a bed and breakfast. You wanna look around? I or? would love to All look right, around. Come on. This is charming. Oh my yeah, gosh. so we made it so people would really understand that they're, it's a farm. You're, this is agritourism at its best. So you invite people to come out here and do they get to participate in Absolutely. cheese Absolutely. Are they cheese making? Sometimes it's card playing. But the most fun we have is taking selfies with the pig and milking cows. <laughs> That's great. So you have a pig here too? Yeah, we have a pet pig that we can't seem to get rid of. We had two and one you know, had an accident and fell in the freezer. And then, <laughs> um, now we have one that my wife has attached herself to. A lot of people go out and buy hobby farms, but this is not this a This is not a hobby farm. farm. I signed up to go to the University of Vermont Artists and Cheese program. Oh, fantastic. So I did all of that, and then um, I learned how to make cheese from there and just practice, practice, practice. And we're still in the experimental phase, so we're working on that and, and getting as much feedback as we possibly can. I just thought you made amazing cheese. No, we just have a little bit of fun. It's You're living... The dream. The dream. <laughs> All right, so we're working through the steps of cheese making. And so what is this going to end up being? So what we've got is a cheddar base 
but it's a full cream cheddar base. So the full fat cheese actually helps wines taste better, more distinct. And that's what makes this a little bit different is that we do not touch the fat content. That's what an artisan cheese is all about. I like how you think. I totally like how I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and how many cheeses do you make? Uh, last count was 17. 17 different kinds of cheese? Yeah, well, we do 17 varieties because we will take a Gouda and a smoke it. Or uh, we'll smoke a Havarti or we'll put something in something else. We'll have different varieties with different things in it. And this is going to be your Robler special. These are our Robler special. Jerry's a great guy. Absolutely, absolutely. And makes some really fun wines. Oh, there's your pig. Hi, sweetie. So uh, this is, I think, our mascot now. I What's his name? Wilbur, of course. Oh, Wilbur. If he sees the food bucket, everything is fun. But if he sees you without a food bucket, he closes his eyes and acts like he's asleep. Because <laughs> then you won't make him move. Oh, my God. So come on in, see the girls. Hello, ladies. All cows have a cheese merit associated with them. Cheese merits from zero to a thousand. The highest cheese merit cow in the world is a cow, a bull named Zuma out of Denmark. Every cow in our herd has a relationship to Zuma. We have a cow that's gonna compete with that Zuma on her cheese and her weight. That's amazing. So now that we've had a tour of this gorgeous farm, it's time to try the cheese. It's my favorite part. The cheese that we're gonna start out with is my version of Havarti. It is sweet and nutty. So even though it's a mild cheese, it still has a really deep flavor. So then we're gonna to move to uh, a Gouda. Um, for us, a Gouda is a little stronger, not as sweet. The answer to this Gouda, is not by itself, is the answer is a good old fashioned pickle and cheese sandwich. So the Gouda is not like any Gouda that I've had. The texture is like silky, velvety, yeah. it's beautiful. It's that extra cream that you get into that. Because you're not cutting the fat. Because I'm not cutting the fat. Too. Oh, thank goodness you're not cutting the fat, it's delicious. <laughs> this last cheese is that Jersey Jack. So Monterey Jack style cheese is a fat controlled cheese, wonderful cheese, good texture, holds up to a burger. This cheese does all of those things, except it's not fat controlled. So you can put it on that slider for that grass-based beef and things like that, and it holds up. It has that wonderful tang to it and just a beautiful silky texture. This is what Monterey Jack should be. So this cheese is a special cheese. This is a cheese that I'm probably the only maker in the United States. This is a Missouri special. This is a cheese named after here. It's a mixture of uh, baby Swiss cheese and a uh, Hauter or a Gouda cheese. That's intense. Oh my gosh. Yeah, are you having fun? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's an intellectual pursuit for me as much as it is anything else. I really want to think about finding the cheese that I will enjoy making for the rest of my life because once you get that cheese that people like, you're gonna make that cheese over and over and over and over again. It's like being a rock star. Yeah, and, and you, so you get to song. sing that song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for opening up the creamery to us. It's really no a problem. special place. He's totally a famous pig. Our trip to Cool Cow Creamery was a lot of fun, not just because of Wilbur the pig, but their cheeses are really incredible. And if you have a chance to track some down, I highly recommend that you do. Um, okay, I'm gonna get started on my cake. The first thing is I'm going to mix together the dry ingredients. So I need a cup and a half of just regular all-purpose flour. Okay, got our flour. I have a cup of sugar. A little bit of salt. You always have to have a little salt in your baked goods so that the sweetness is not overly sweet. And if you're looking for the recipe, don't worry. You don't have to write all this down. You can find everything at feastmagazine.com in our recipes section. And just a couple of teaspoons of baking powder. Okay, 
all mixed up. Now, the wet ingredients. Obviously, we're going to be using yogurt, and I need a cup of that. Yum, I love yogurt. When I was a kid, we lived in Turkey, and that's where I got to know what really good, full-fat, non-sugary yogurt tasted like. And once it became popular here in the States, I was in heaven, I love this stuff. Okay, so we have a cup of full-fat yogurt, Greek if possible, because it has less moisture. Then I'm going to use a half a cup of olive oil. You can use a neutral oil if you want, but I'm using olive oil because it's really going to heighten that Mediterranean flavor from the oranges and the yogurt. And it's a wonderful addition to baked goods. So rather than canola or just vegetable oil, give it a try. All right. And a couple of eggs. Because of all the wonderful fat that we have in this cake, it's going to keep really nicely for a few days without drying out. Whisking all of this together. It's nice and smooth, and now I'm gonna go ahead and add in all of that orange zest. This cake is easily adapted to whatever flavors you want to include. I am doing chocolate and orange, because that's what I like, but you can do lemon, you could do raspberry, you could do vanilla, you could do pretty much anything that you want. All righty, so now I'm just going to fold my wet ingredients into my dry ingredients, and then I'm going to add the chocolate. So I'm gonna finish stirring in this chocolate, and while I do, let's head to Prairie Fruits Farm. It's up near Champaign-Urbana in Illinois. They are a goat dairy, and not only do they make amazing cheeses, they also host incredible chef dinners. Check it out. I'm standing here with Orzo, one of the many extremely cute goats at Prairie Fruits Farm, which is the first farmstead creamery in Illinois. We're gonna get behind the scenes with Leslie and Wes and find out how they launched this agritourism destination. First off, tell me how the farm came to be. Well, we uh, moved here in 2003 uh, from Madison, Wisconsin. I grew up on a little fruit farm, but we'd also had animals. I milked the cow when I was a kid, and uh, we had some goats. So I really wanted to eat a dead ripe peach off a tree, and I hadn't really been able to do that since I left my home farm and um, buying supermarket peaches was just no substitute. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, we planted about two acres of fruit trees and berries and uh, got started with that in 2004. So what brought on the goats? Uh, Leslie uh, brought on the goats by and large because uh, we would met a couple of really great uh, goat cheese makers up uh, in Wisconsin at the Dane County Farmers Market. And uh, Leslie said, we've got a few acres, we've got a barn, why don't we uh, try goats? So we got three does and a buck in 2004, and that gave us milk uh, starting on Thanksgiving. So Leslie made cheese for, with it, experimented with it. We tried it out on friends and uh, acquaintances and people who know cheese, and they said it's good. So we started in January, February of 2005 and became the first farmstead creamery in Illinois.
We make about nine different kinds of cheese, all from goat's milk. So we are exclusively farmstead. We're very small scale. The fact that we're seasonal uh, and we embrace the seasonality of the milk. We don't try to manipulate the milk to get uniformity. We just kind of go with what the milk gives us. It makes for more interesting cheeses. And having that very direct connection between animal and finished product is always ever present in everything that we do. I, I find that to be the most satisfying aspect of our farm. So tell me what breeds of goats you have. We have a earless breed, the uh, La Manchas. They were developed in uh, California and Oregon. We got them because they produce the highest butterfat and protein on average of the goat breeds. And when you make cheese, you're interested in solids. They look a little funny uh, to many people. It's a little hard to get used to sometimes, but they're great animals. They're very smart. They're not as noisy as our other uh, breed, which is a Nubian, the long-eared breed. That's this one right here. That's that one, just for demonstration purposes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you've never met a goat, come to a place like Prairie Fruits Farm and see just how incredibly sweet and interactive these animals are. Yeah. When did you start doing the dinners? Well, we started the dinners in 2008, and really the, the basis for that was we met a lot of other farmers, small farmers uh, in Illinois, and we knew there was great products being uh, generated by those farmers, so we felt like we should highlight those in some way. And it seemed like the best way to do that would be to actually have people come see how the food's produced and have their minds open about what the issues are with food production but also taste really, really good food and meet other people. The idea behind the 100-yard dinner came about fairly early on in the uh, evolution of our farm-to-table meals. We said, okay, the ultimate challenge would be to create a very diverse five-course meal from ingredients grown or raised within, and we just sort of randomly selected 100 yards of where the guests are gonna be eating. And that, that was the challenge. And every year, we've done different things to meet the challenge. Our partnership with Christine and Josh, the founders of originally Sunday Dinner Club and then Honey Butter Fried Chicken, was based on a long-standing relationship with them as purchasers of our cheese. And they started coming here very early on in the life of our dinners on the farm, and we've had them every year. Wes and Leslie kind of created this really neat series of inviting chefs down here to the farm. Uh, we were very honored to come down here. And there's nothing better than, than their cheese and the stuff that they grow here on the farm. Today we're doing brunch pizza, just incredibly delicious. So we made a really long, slow fermented dough um, that has great flavor. Um, we're gonna make a flatbread with some goat sausage that we made ourselves, um, a little bit of roasted tomato sauce with tomatoes from the farm, and then one of Leslie's beautiful cheeses that will be put on top of that. We're also gonna do a chicken confit hash. We're trying to do everything and as much as possible as we can from within 100 yards of the dinner table. To really see it and really connect uh, with the farmers and with the food is, is just a meditative and important experience for, for people to have. I know it has been for me. You don't necessarily need to call yourself a farm-to-table restaurant. You need to just have that be your way of doing business. And I think the culinary schools have a role to play because they teach it more like, this is hip and cool right now, this is what you should do, how, you know, have a relationship with a farmer. But from the farmer's standpoint, we don't want the hip and cool, we just, we, we want to keep going and we want to have a robust farm business and we want to have these long-standing relationships with these chefs. So I think if it becomes what they would consider to be normal food procurement, 
then I see that as ultimately the way to sustain farms like ours. That was a very fun experience. And if you've never met a goat, I highly recommend that you do. These animals are so playful and so interactive. It's a real treat to actually go to one of those farms and be able to interact with the animals the way that we were able to at Prairie Fruits Farm. All right, so I am going to go ahead and put my finished batter into my prepared pan. There we go, pretty easy. I'm just gonna put this into a 350 degree oven for roughly 50 minutes. I'm gonna keep my eye on it and when it's golden and risen, then it's going to be ready to eat. This looks amazing and it smells incredible. The scent of the orange is really coming through. This is gorgeous and you can see just how moist the crumb is in this cake and that is because of the yogurt. All right, I can't wait any longer. I have to give this a taste. The orange flavor has spread throughout the entire batter. The scent is wonderful, but the flavor is even better. And having that dark chocolate, the little hits of it inside of the cake, delicious. So I will be baking cakes with yogurt from here on out. Thanks for joining me in this episode of Feast TV, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>